Hi, this is Roger. Thanks for dropping by. Another couple of the um, viewers' requests to be knocked off the list. And this is pests and diseases. Not an easy subject, quite honestly. And I'll say right at the beginning, prevention is better than cure. You can stop the flipping things happening in the first place, you'll do well. But it's not always that easy. Um, that's going over now. At last, I might be able to repot it. Um, <clears throat> lots of people have commented on my Thai angel totally changing colour. And I agree. Looking at the pictures, this was pink with veining. And this time round, it's purple with far less veining. These things happen. Right, pests list off, starting with aphids. Um, in the main, on orchids, you're liable to see green aphids, but you can get grey aphids, you can get black aphids. They come in all sorts of colours, but they basically die just as easy as each other. Um, so that's aphids. Um, mealybugs, you are liable to get these on your orchids. They die easy, not a big deal. We'll go over that in a minute. Um, and then we get on to the more serious pests that you can get. Thrips are, uh, they come and go seasonally, but if you get them in a confined space like I've got here, they are bad news. Um, they've got many life stages and that therein lies the problem because no one treatment will kill all of those life stages. You've got scale. Two types of scale, uh, Bois Duval, I think it's called, and the other type. <laughs> Either way, they're a bit of a nuisance because they hang around. You appear to have got rid of them and then suddenly they reappear. Um, there's other sort of pests you might get that um, you might misconstrue as being destructive. Things like springtails, they get in the media and you water it and they bounce around all over the place, they jump, springtails, it's all in the name you know. Um, and, oh hello, let's just shut that off for a minute, we can do without that at the moment. Come on, off, thank you. <laughs> Humidity's at 70%, I don't really need that on at the moment, not at the temperature I've got. Um, you will get other things come in. Um, we're on about pests here, so we've got slugs and snails. They can get into mainly areas that have access to outside. So your windowsill growers and your home growers probably would never see slugs and snails. And we can get on to bigger stuff if you've got a greenhouse. What about mice? Yeah, They can get in your greenhouse and they will totally decimate new growths and things like that. Um, right, dealing with pests, um, you could say that by applying a systemic pesticide to your orchids on a regular basis would prevent the problem in the first place. The problem you've got with that is a constant application, especially if you use the same pesticide, can breed resistance. So you kill off 99% of the pests, 1% survive. Yeah, and they become immune to your pesticide. So if you're going to do that sort of thing, rotate your pesticides. Now try doing that in the UK, <laughs> and I'm sure in various other places. There are countries worse than the UK where you can't get a systemic pesticide. They're just all banned. Um, I mean, I've got a chemical in my arsenal that um, I could actually go to prison for even owning. It's one of the really old ones. You know, those that actually worked and killed everything. <laughs> Trouble is, um, at suitable strengths, they could kill us too. So you, you can sort of see the point there. Anyway, you have to look at each pest in turn. So starting with the big stuff, mice <laughs> and the like, you know, rodents. Um, stop them getting in is the easy way and don't be fooled you look at the size of a mouse and you think oh they can't get that in that little gap apparently they can get through a keyhole <laughs> where your key fits to lock your door 
Um, so don't be fooled into thinking your gaps, if you've got any, are too small for mice to get in. They can. Slugs and snails, um, again, prevention. Stop them getting in in the first place. Close up all your gaps, seal your joints. You have a look round the top of my place. Everywhere's taped. It needs refreshing in places because it's starting to come away. Now you might think, why am I worrying about slugs and snails up in the roof? They'll get in the roof. They don't all come in at ground level. They'll come in wherever they find a hole. Um, so slugs and snails, um, you can do it by eye. You can go out at night with a torch and play hunt the slug, hunt the snail. That's great fun when you've got better things to do. Um, but quite honestly, there's quite easy ways to catch them um, and then you dispose of them as you see fit, including putting your boot on the flipping things. But things like cucumber, um, slices of apple, um, just put them on the top of any suspect pots or on a tray, on a shelf, anywhere where they can get at. I don't mean a tray with sides like this because they'd have to get up and over and they might not bother, just a flat thing. Um, slices of apple, slices of cucumber, anything fresh like that, they'll go for it. And then they'll hang around, yeah? So they're easy to spot. You still need to go out in the dark with a torch because during the day they're just going to hide. And don't play find the slug in the daytime because you will fail miserably. <laughs> However, once it gets dark and it cools down, they're on the move. And um, the scent of things like cucumber and um, slices of apple and stuff like that will attract them and draw them in. And don't think they're slow moving. They can actually get a bit of a shift on when they're hungry. So that, that's that. <coughs> Coming back to the smaller stuff, thrips are a pain if you get them in an in enclosed space because they're difficult to get rid of. Um, you see my sticky papers up there, they're yellow. Apparently they're no good for thrips. They're good for summit, there's lots of dots all over it. Oh, there's a bee on there as well. How the hell did that get in here? Um, never mind. Um, but effectively, the blue sticky papers apparently are good attracting and trapping and therefore killing the adult flying insects of thrips. Don't forget we talk about thrips as though there's only one. There's dozens and dozens of species of thrips. Um, some of which would probably take no notice of your orchids but some do. The damage is normally caused by on buds and blooms and things like that. They are a real pain if, if they get a hold. They burrow they get into things, so they'll get inside the buds and damage the blooms before they've even opened. Um, but their various life stages makes them difficult to control. From eggs into crawly things, um, mutating as they go along, and eventually into flying um, insects that don't live long, but they breed quick. Yeah, so you've got all those different life stages. There is very, very little you can do about the egg stage of any of these pests, quite honestly. You've got to wait for the flipping things to hatch and then deal with them. And systemics deal with most of what you're going to come across, if you can get hold of them, obviously. So, blue sticky paper can trap adult thrips, but you would need to have quite a lot of them because they'll breed quickly, literally. So they may well have bred and laid eggs before you trap them on your blue sticky paper, if you see what I mean. Um, I believe, not that I've ever had thrips, that these things will trap the adults too. Yeah, pinguiculars, things like sundews, any of the carnivorous plants in amongst your orchids. If you're environment is suitable for them. Just because some orchids are growing well doesn't mean the carnivorous plants will, um, but they can do and, and, and certainly some will help. Um, so with thrips you're looking at um, soaking the whole pot to get, because they'll live in the media. And in fact several of their life stages, stages are based in the media. They don't come out, they don't come out to play at all. So you've got to get at them in there. 
So a soak with something that can kill things. Um, I'm not going into a list of suitable chemicals and things like that because it varies through every single country around the world. You'd think the EU would be nice and uniform, wouldn't you? Like hell it is. Some things that are allowed in, for instance, Spain or Italy are not allowed in the UK and yet we're all supposed to be one big community. Um, anyway, so thrips, just do your best. The blue sticky papers will whack the adults, the flying versions. Systemics will get a, a lot of the stages, but not all of them. So you have to bear in mind you're going to need lots of repeat treatments to get at them. And um, they are difficult. Coming back to scale, um, the same logic applies, quite honestly. Um, the crawlers can be mobile. If they're happy where they are, they'll stay on that plant. If they're not, if they're not they'll move. The adult scale becomes stationary. They're like a little limpet on your um, leaves, on your canes, um, down near the base of the plant. They'll get all over the place. And underneath there is where the eggs are laid and the new crawler stage will emerge from. The crawler stage is easy to kill. Eggs, virtually impossible. And whatever's under those limpet adults is quite difficult to get at because they've got like a waxy coating. But again, a systemic should stop them getting out of hand. Um, the soapy wash type things will work for scale, but you will have to repeat frequently. But they don't do any harm to your plants. They're environmentally friendly, so that's good stuff. Yeah, we like that. Um, so <laughs> yes, I've just said I like that. I still use the strong stuff. <laughs> yeah. Bit of both, perhaps. Um, uh, where did we get to? Scale. So you'll need to do a bit of work with that. Um, something came up on the Facebook group about the using bleach. Um, I know it has worked for some people. I know it hasn't worked for others. And I know some that have actually lost plants as a consequence. And the main problem with using the bleach is there are no measurements. How much do you use? How strong? Do you make your solution? And without that guidance, it's flipping hit and miss, quite honestly. Too weak and it won't work. Too strong, you damage your plant. Somewhere in between, it can work quite well. <laughs> but it's a guess. That's the problem with it. So you take the risk. I'm not recommending that because I don't like things that don't have um, precise dosages, if you see what I mean. Um, but yeah, they get, that can work. And then coming back from scale, we get to the mealybugs. They die easy, quite honestly. Um, any type of bug spray will deal with them. If it's a non-systemic, it will need multiple applications. That applies across the board. Um, if it's systemic, you often find one dose will do the job. They um, breed quickly. So from the egg stage to hatching out is fast. So the systemic's still in the plant by the time that happens. So um, that's not too bad. Aphids, quite honestly, you squirt them off with a jet of water. <laughs> They're easy. And all the other stuff I've mentioned will work for aphids. Um, they're probably the least common. And yet out in your garden, they're the most common. But, um, you know, that's life. You have to deal with it. Um, right. Diseases. Um, viruses first, quite rare. N this is not common stuff, this is not panic mode, these do not occur frequently. Um, spreading viruses is normally done by us humans, unsterilized tools, you know, dirty things, uh, just lack of hygiene basically, but unsterilized tools and cross contamination is a good way to spread it. But that doesn't explain how you got the thing in the first place, does it? To spread it, you must have already had it. This is something people just tend to forget. Um, you will bring a virus in. You're very, very unlikely to catch a virus on any of your plants. It's going to come in on another plant. And don't, don't get me wrong, that can be from a mate, a friend, an Orchid Society member, um, a nursery, uh, a cellar, uh, anything, it can get in on the grounds that 
most of the viruses can live in an orchid happily. I'll elaborate. In other words, if the plant is strong and healthy, it'll live with it. Put the plant under stress, like a repot or too much heat or too much cold. Put the plant under stress and the virus comes out and it will start taking hold of the plant and it can kill it. Um, no known cure for viruses. Difficult to detect, difficult to actually establish that your plant has got a virus because the symptoms can look like so many other things. But quite honestly, I'd put viruses to one side on the grounds they are unlikely enough that, um, you know, I wouldn't worry too much about them. I've got one down here. My little Miltoniopsis, the yellow one that's been in bloom for ages. This potentially has a virus. And it may well have a virus. Well, what suddenly brought that on? I've had this plant for ages. It's been doing quite well. Well, I did say signs of stress, didn't I? It's bloomed. That saps its reserves. It was recently repotted, or relatively recently. That upsets the root system. Yeah? And in addition to that, it's a Miltoniopsis. It likes to stay cool. Is it cool around here at the moment? No. Multiple stresses to this plant could have allowed this to break out. I'm not giving up on it. At the end of the day, if it is a virus and it's come out and showing on the leaves, the plant's going to die. That's why it's separate and not touching anything else. So, you know, the problem I've got with that plant is it was a gift. And in theory, it hasn't caught that virus here. It already had it. That worries me. Because that, I'm assuming now that the mother plant's got it. And maybe it'll come out there one day. Who knows? Right, that's viruses. You've got ring spot, um, cymbidium mosaic virus. Uh, there's various others. Um, whichever one you get, there are signs. You can look it up on the internet. I'm not going into viruses in a big deal because they are so rare. Um, I believe in all my time I've been growing orchids, I've had three orchids that I know definitely had a virus. Now, this one came into bloom last time and it had bad colour break and quite a distorted bloom on it. And lots of people said, it's got a virus, chuck it out. As it hell. <laughs> so don't make assumptions. Give your plant a chance. There is nothing wrong with this orchid, nothing wrong at all. But a lot of people would have had me bin that or take it out in the backyard and put a flamethrower on it. Because the symptoms said it was virused. And I gave it a chance. And the blooms have come out clean, strong new growth, good new root system, and two nice, healthy, perfectly coloured and formed blooms. So don't make snap decisions. Give your plants a chance. So that's viruses. Other diseases. Um, <clears throat> if you take away viruses, which are the most uncommon, I presume, the next thing you go into is rot. Now, rot can take many forms. Um, you can have black rot, brown rot, and orange rot. <laughs> They've all got proper names, and I, I can't even be bothered to go and look them up to find out what they're actually called, because it doesn't matter to me. What matters to me is which bit of the plant it's got hold of. Now, if you've got a new growth that decides to fail miserably and go black and mushy, the chances are it was a non-mobile nutrient failure somewhere along the line, something like calcium. The plant hasn't got the strength to, you know, actually build that new growth. And it's a cell-related issue. Um, brown rot, um, it's, it's just very similar. The problem with brown rot is, although it's called a rot, strictly speaking, it's more likely to be a bacterial infection. Yeah? 
and once you get a bacterial infection it will act fast it will take down your whole plant in days so at the first sign cut it out whatever bit of the plant is on cut it out seal the wound cinnamon job yeah so same with the black rot if you get either of those two just deal with them fast and this is where the where whole plants go down is where people don't look at their plants frequently due to workload or lifestyles or whatever and you know perhaps only water on Sunday when when it's their day off well a plant could have had six days to fester in that time and in that amount of time a bacterial rot will have taken down the plant and you come to look at your plant the leaves have all gone limp your bulbs are all mushy and the plants had it yeah if you've still got a good bit on the plant that looks healthy strong isn't mushy and not discolored in any way you can try saving that bit and it'll often work I've got some plants in here recovering that to all intents and purposes were totally lost due to bacterial rot but I managed to save a bit the bit that it hadn't got to yet another couple of days and those plants would have been totally lost so this is where it comes, you know, looking at your plants. Keep your eye on things. <laughs> Don't neglect them. And there's no substitute for picking your plants up and having a good look. I mean, this plant here um, looks wrong because the leaves are pale. Very pale. It's an oncidium type. The reason they're pale, it's got too much light. It's not a deficiency down here. You have to bear in mind I monitor what I feed my plants on. If this plant was unhealthy, would it be doing this? Probably not. This is going to be a hell of a spike on this one. This is um, on Costelli Catatanti. Each one of these branches is much better than I have ever seen on this plant before. This is going to be one hell of a spike this year. Starting to show colour in places. So I'm looking forward to that. Am I worried? Is this plant diseased? Is it unhealthy? No. It's just had a bit too much light. Why did it have a bit too much light? To get that to happen. <laughs> and now it's been moved. It's out of that bright light. These leaves will probably green up a bit now. Yeah. It's not a big deal. Sometimes pale leaves is nothing more than heavy on the light. And sometimes you need to push them like that to get them to bloom. There's one up. Oh, let me just show you this one. This is a Miltonia, not Miltoniopsis. That's had too much light. And that new growth has failed. You see the brown leaf coming out of the top? That was quite soggy. Yeah? Is it soggy now? No, it's bone dry. So that is not going to grow anymore but it's not going to rot down into the plant. Why? Because it's dried out. Why did it go in the first place? I've been using the sprayer. And sometimes, due to workload, that sprayer has been used a bit late in the day. What happens later in the day? All the systems shut down, the fans go off, and there's water in the crown. And then it gets cold. Well, not cold, but cooler overnight. That's my own fault, but at least I know why. But I'm not going to lose the bulb. I'm not going to lose the plant just because of a little bit of sogginess in uh, one particular new growth. So that's the black rot and the brown rot. The orange rot, I have no answer. I have still yet to see any writings that actually say that there's a cure as such. Um, the closest I've got that I can show you, which I can't... Ouch. You kick the table, why don't you, in your open toed sandals. This plant here, that brown stain was a bright orange. This plant had the dreaded orange rot. You see that rusty markings on that leaf? That's an old leaf. Yeah? And it's just stopped. I don't know why, but that orange stain on that leaf that looked like it was going to take the whole plant down has gone brown and completely dried up. I don't know why. So as far as that orange rot is concerned, 
I can't help you because I don't know anything about it. I don't know how it starts and I certainly don't know how to stop it. So that's the various rots um, and bacterial infections. The next side of the fence is the fungal infections. These are different and these can be killed. Any fungal infection can be absolutely decked. You need to get your old systemic fungicide on there but that won't deal with that bacterial rot. It's a totally different thing. You know, you're dealing with a whole different principle of life form. But a fungal infection can be dealt with. The one that we all love to hate is the dreaded F word, the fusarium. And that is rife, quite honestly. That is all over the place. It's in lots of people's collections and they may not even know it. Um, it's in nurseries, it's, it's even in some of the mass producers, I believe. <laughs> Don't quote me on that. <laughs> I'll end up with little red dots on my chest. <laughs> uh, but yeah, um, the fungal infections, um, apart from Fusarium, are not that common. But you can get like mould growing in your pot. That's a type of fungus, uh, sort of. Um, you can get mushrooms growing in your pot. It normally stems from just poor quality media or lack of sterilization in the process that produced the media or it's going, the media's breaking down, it's going off and it's staying wet too long. Um, so it can happen. But a fungal infection can be dealt with. If you've got something in your pot that looks wrong, some white fluffy stuff or anything like that, get the plant out of the pot when you're ready. It's not a panic, you know. <laughs> when you're ready, get the plant out of the pot, give it a good clean up, get all the old media off, use the old H2O2, the hydrogen peroxide, 3%, and that should deck anything that's left on the plant, and repot in fresh new media, and you'll probably be fine. The fungal infections, apart from the fusarium, which gets right into the plant, are normally quite easy to deal with. Yeah. So I may have missed some, I might not have covered every, everything, but I've sort of gone over most of the sort of things you can come across. And um, this plant has something wrong with it. I did some chopping today and cut some of the new growths right back and put cinnamon on the joint. Something wrong with this plant and as yet I haven't discovered what it is. But at the moment what I've done is taken off the bits that don't look right. I had the... Um, systemic fungicide out today and although this plant I believe hasn't got spider mites it's got signs that they might have been there once so that got a spray whether it needed it or not so in theory if there were any spider mites it's dealt with them don't forget you've got two types of red spider mites you've got the red spider mites which if you've got them on a plant wet your thumb which I've just done, having touched the fungicide, uh, pesticide, and rub the plant like that and you'll get a rusty stain on your thumb. That's red spider mite. With the other type, you won't get that. But the <laughs> symptoms are the same. Little pocky marks. I mean, if you've got them really bad, you'll start getting little webs all, <laughs> all over your thing. Not to be confused with real spiders that leave webs and don't do any harm at all. And you've got to have a really bad infestation to start getting the actual webs. But, um, yeah, spider mites. Some people say they're too small to see. I've had red spider mite in here. I can flip and see them from two foot away. But the other type, I don't know about because I'm not sure I've ever had them. Um, I may have done and they got they were got rid of as a routine sort of precaution that actually got rid of them. But this plant could have something very serious wrong, seriously wrong with it. It's got marks on the underside of many of the leaves. Several of the new growths have failed and rotted. And these, this part of the plant here is the oldest part of the plant. This part of the plant was there when I bought it. It's these newer ones up here. But as I said, I've taken off everything I wasn't happy with. It's blooming. I'm happy with that. Plenty more buds to come as well. So watch out for spider mites. They can catch you out. Um, it is said that in a humid atmosphere they don't do too well. Um, that really applies to the red spider mite. 
I've heard stories of the other type of spider mite actually thriving right in the line of fire of a mister. <laughs> so, you know, you, you do your reading and you do your research. Spider mites will normally go down okay with a systemic pesticide. Um, they should do. If not, the old soapy wash stuff, you know, the sort of environmentally friendly, that will get rid of them. But repeat applications will be required because that stuff doesn't kill eggs. Yeah. So that's, that's my lot. And um, yeah, I mean, it, it's a case of good luck with it. If you've got an orchid collection in a confined space and you get some pests, you will need to deal with them. If you grow outside and your plants are strong and healthy, it is rumoured <laughs> by certain individuals that the bugs will just go elsewhere. They'll go somewhere else in your garden. But when you grow in a confined space, like in your home or in a greenhouse or somewhere like I've got, there's nowhere else to go. So the only solution is to deal with them in whatever way you, you see fit. Um, I would love to never use strong chemicals, but then I don't want my plants going down as a consequence of not using them. So I try and balance it. And um, do you know, I do believe that's got buds coming on it. Sorry, I get distracted sometimes. That looks like a bud coming out there. That's good because, whoops, clang. Those are going to go soon. That one will be a bit farther because that one opened a bit later. It'd be nice to have another one coming. Pretty blooms. <clears throat> yeah, so bugs and diseases, if you are free from them, have never had them, and you've been growing donkey's years, then pat yourself on the back. Most of us get them in one shape or, or another at some point. And um, there's plenty of places to go and read on the internet about various things. Just look up spider mites on orchids and you'll get shed loads of information about what to do about it. Some of it conflicting, but you know, you can take an average of what you read and um, there will always be a solution. Don't get me wrong, there is nothing you can get that can't be solved except those bacterial rots. There is no solution. I'm not sure there's even a prevention. If you get it, cut it out fast. See, that's all I can say. I don't, there is no cure, I believe, apart from getting rid of the infected material and separate, separating out the material that hasn't yet been, been infected. And quite honestly, it's the most fast acting and most serious thing you can ever get is a bacterial rot. It'll take your pseudo bulbs down, they'll go mushy. I mean, I had one once that I took out to deal with, <clears throat> and um, the pseudo bulb was a real browny, orangey sort of colour. And as I touched it, it burst. It was full of infected liquid, and the smell was revolting. Now, that plant is here. I managed to save one bulb. And that one bulb is now starting to recover. And I really hope it does, because that's my Odontoglossum crispum, believe it or not. And that's it. That's all that was left. But it is growing, and that one bulb was the one I managed to rescue before it got infected. That's taken a year, from there to there. And it's still struggling. But it is now producing some roots, its first new growth is not going to go anywhere. The next new growth is better. I suspect the third one will be back up to full size. Yeah? So, um, if in doubt, they say, chuck it out. Well, sometimes things are precious. I'd have a job to get that again, quite honestly. So I'm trusting to this recovering. Yeah? But that was a bacterial rot. That went down fast. I had a Phalaenopsis that um, a couple of winters ago I brought the Phalaenopsis and a couple of other things into the house to, to avoid the cold in the winter. And I had a Phalaenopsis that I watered and um, it was happy, it was fine, the leaves were good, everything was right with it. Three days later 
the whole root system had rotted and collapsed and I still don't know what did that but that was some sort of bacterial infection because nothing else can work that fast so keep your eye out for that um, and as I said if your lifestyle and your workload means that you can only look at your plants once a week that's the sort of thing that will kill a plant in the gap between you last looking at it and it looking okay and then coming round again a week later and finding that the whole plant's collapsed and there's not a lot you can do about it unless you can catch it fast so that's it anything that you think I've missed or anything like that stick another question in the comments and I'll see if I know anything about it um, but most of the time I'm talking about stuff that I've either read about or that I've actually had I haven't had thrips I have had the old slug in here I have had plants a long time ago that had the tiny little snails in their pot when I brought them in and they managed to get into some other pots as well so I've had those I haven't had a mouse yet I've got two cats already <laughs> they'd have trouble getting between how they get in here and avoiding the cats so I haven't had those um, I've had an odd aphid attack um, very rare but I've had you know a flower spike like this and you just come in one morning and there's loads of aphids on it and you sort of think they weren't there yesterday and now they are well you can just stick them under the tap and wash them off the worst comes to the worst they're easy I've had scale and I've still got them I've had mealybug and I've still got some you know I've had bacterial rots uh, I haven't still got some <laughs> they work fast uh, you can't say you've still got a bacterial rot if you've got it it's going to kill your plant unless you act fast so you've either got a dead plant or it's in progress or you haven't got it um, fungal stuff I've had fusarium um, you've seen the videos on it um, I may still have it lurking in a couple of plants um, but I deal with that on a reasonably regular basis that um, the systemic fungicide gets applied to susceptible plants a couple of times a year and it just seems to keep it at bay um, yeah so that's it uh, my take on pests and diseases and um, just remember that your viruses are rare as I said in all the time I've been growing orchids I've had three one of which is current and under suspicion it's just the patterning on the leaves I've still got this theory that that could have been the rather strong feed that the um, mounts were getting above this plant and dripping all over it followed or alongside the fact that it was in light that was much too bright for it which could have had a burning effect um, this is a low light Miltoniopsis but that looks like a potential virus to me so it gets kept separate it gets watered separate it's got a new growth we'll see what that looks like when it grows on if it grows on if the virus has taken a hold on this plant chances are that new growth is going to fail so we'll see how it goes but um, it's a rare event in all the plants I've had this is the third one and that's in a lot of years so it's not common and nine times out of ten you'll bring it in on, on a plant and that's the plant that will suffer the chances of it spreading to the rest of your collection are very slim and if it does it's your own fault normally where you've repotted five or six plants at the same time and use the same scissors to trim the roots starting with the one with the virus and then passing it on to the others it, it, it's normally us that spreads viruses so uh, that's it that's going to have ended up being quite a long one it's late in the evening and um, <laughs> I was just going to say my wine's getting cold <laughs> that'll be the day um, but yeah um, I, I need to collapse in the chair now and finish my day and this video will get posted tomorrow I'm not messing about with it tonight so this will be tomorrow's video very late in the day I don't normally film this time of day but um, I just went over the list and I thought I can knock this one out and um, now it's done so that's, that's that see you next time